Hello, this is Yashwin. In this video, I'll be solving paper 2, variant 2, February, March 2023, AS level biology. Question 1a, table 1.1 lists cell structures that can be found in eukaryotic cells or prokaryotic cells. Some of these cell structures can be found in both of these types of cells. And you're supposed to complete the table using a tick to show that uh, if the structure is present and across if it's not in each type of cell in every box. Golgi body, just like all other membrane bound organs, is only found in eukaryotic cells and not in prokaryotic cell. So you've got a cross in the second column. Circular DNA is present in both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. The DNA in eukaryotic nuclei of eukaryotic cells is in the form of chromosomes, which is not circular. However, mitochondria and chloroplasts in eukaryotic cells do have circular DNA. Again, 70s ribosomes are found in chloroplasts and mitochondria of eukaryotic cells, and prokaryotic cells also have 70s ribosomes. B. All cells have a cell surface membrane in figure 5.1. You're shown a transmission electron micrograph of part of two adjacent animal cells, cell 1 and 2. In the provided space, draw a diagram of the region in the box labeled R on figure 1.1. Your diagram should show the four dark lines. Label the diagram to identify what's shown by the dark lines and each of the three spaces between them. So these are the four dark lines. The question is asking about and these are the spaces between the lines so the two dark lines is one cell surface membrane of cell 1 and the lower ones are the cell surface membrane of cell 2 as you'd know cell surface membrane is a bilipid layer so it's got phospho two layers of phospholipids in each cell surface membrane and then this is the space between the two membranes you should occupy most of the space that's provided in the question paper So here I've drawn the diagram. The dark lines here, they represent hydrophilic phosphate heads. The space between the two dark lines is the interior of the cell surface membrane composed of the tails of phospholipids, which is what makes them hydrophobic. And then between the two cell surface membranes of the two cells, you've got the intracellular cellular space with tissue fluid. Intracellular space allows substances to be exchanged, exchanged between the cell and its environment. For example, oxygen can diffuse into the cell and carbon dioxide will diffuse out of it. C. Mitogens are short chains of amino acids that function as cell signaling molecules. Mitogens are released from secretory cells and travel in the blood to target cells where they, they bind to cell surface receptors. The target cells respond by progressing from G1 phase to S phase of the mitotic cell cycle. So let's have a look at the mitotic cell cycle. First, you've got the entire cell cycle which, in which you have the interphase and then the nuclear division by mitosis and then lastly you've got cytokinesis which is the division of the cell itself. So this entirely would be interphase. This is mitosis and this is cytokinesis. So inside of interphase, you've got G1 
S phase and G2 in that order. In G1 phase, the cell will grow, for example, by producing proteins and by increasing in size. And then during S phase, you've got semi-conservative replication of DNA. Part two, as a result of mutation, the production and release of mitogens into the blood can be greatly increased. So just a possible consequence for target cells of increased concentrations of mitogens in the blood. So we saw that mitogens can cause cells to progress from G1 phase to S phase. And as a result of this, mitotic cell cycle would be sped up, which, mean, which means mitogens increase the rate of cell division. So this mutation, which increases mitogens, will increase mitosis, which can also lead to forming tumor. Question 2a. Cysteine is an amino acid containing sulfur. Figure 2.1 shows the structure of the molecule formed by joining two cysteine molecules together. Draw a circle around an R group in the molecule in figure 2.1. So R group is the atom or group of atoms that's bonded to the center carbon atom in any amino acid. So here you've got the first amino acid which is bonded to the second amino acid by a peptide bond so any amino acid would have two carbon atoms and a nitrogen atom the group of four atoms bonded to the carbon atom central carbon atom is the r group similarly this one over here is the r group for the second amino acid b goblet cells in the human gas exchange system produce proteins called mucins the ends of the molecules contain cysteine residues. Mucin strands are formed by joining the ends of the molecules together through covalent bonds between R groups. So the question tells you that covalent bonds would form between these two R groups. While studying the structures of proteins, we learn that the bond which forms between two R groups, which contain sulfur, would be called disulfide bonds and that's what you're supposed to do you're supposed to name these covalent bonds bonds are transported out of goblet cells and then absorb water to form mucus so just to explain how mucin strands are transported out of goblet cells Non-polar molecules or hydrophobic molecules can diffuse across the cell surface membranes. Mucin strands are larger polar molecules, so they cannot do that. They will be repelled by the hydrophobic core of the membranes. Not only that, this is also bulk movement, so movement in a large quantity. So for this type of bulk movement of a substance outside of the cell, exocytosis will be carried out. This is an active process which will use ATP. And excretory vesicles will be utilized for exocytosis and they will form from Golga body. Then they will fuse with the cell surface membrane for this movement of the molecules out of the cell. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic mutation genetic disease caused by mutation in the human CFTR gene which results in mucus that's thicker than normal suggest how thicker mucus interferes with maintenance of healthy gas exchange surfaces in lungs for to answer this question you need to know the features of a healthy gas exchange surface because of CFTR gene when mucus becomes thick the cilia will find it difficult to move mucus away 
it will the mucus will accumulate and provide breeding ground for pathogens which will increase the chance of infection ideally you shouldn't have too much of mucus developing close to the gas exchange surface Part D, row 1 and 2 of table 2.1 show the DNA base sequence of part of the normal CFTR allele and some part of mutated CFTR allele. The base sequence shown are for the DNA strands used in the synthesis of RNA. When table 2.1 is completed, row 3 will show the base sequence of the RNA synthesized from the same part of the mutated CFTR allele. One difference between the DNA base sequence in row 1 and the DNA base sequence in row 2 of table 2.1 is caused by a single gene mutation. State the name of this type of gene mutation. The three types of mutations are insertion, deletion, or substitution. By substitution mutation, a base in the sequence will be swapped by a different one. By insertion mutation, a base is randomly inserted into the sequence. By deletion, a base is randomly deleted from the sequence. In these sequences between 1 and 2, you would be able to see that up until this point over here, the DNA base sequence in both the genes is the same. This triplet over here, GAA, is deleted from the normal allele to form the CFTR allele, which you can see by the sequence after this triplet. Both of the alleles have the same sequence of A, C, C, A, and then the alleles continue on. So this is a deletion mutation. Part 2, row 1 and 2 in table 2.1 show the DNA strands used in the synthesis of RNA. State the term used to describe the DNA strand that's used in the synthesis of RNA. This would be the template strand. And now you are supposed to complete table 2.1 to show the missing bases in row 3. Row 3 should be complementary to the bases in row 2. The complementary base in RNA to thymine or T is A. Complementary base, RNA base for A, adenosine is uracil. G binds to C and this would be the same. C or cytosine would bind to guanine and here's the sequence part 4 the normal CFTR allele is approximately 189,000 base pairs in length the CFTR polypeptide consists only of 1480 amino acids. Explain the reasons for this difference between the number of base pairs and the number of amino acids. Every three pairs of bases code for one amino acid. So this means 189,000 base pairs should code for 63,000 amino acids. However, you've only got 1480 amino acids instead. This could be due to a few reasons. A gene can have introns, which is the region of a gene which is not transcribed into RNA. And as a result of this, it does not code for amino acids either. So a lot of the bases from 189,000 bases could be introns that do not code for any amino acid. Second reason could be that mRNA stop codon which does not code for an amino acid either. So again, you've got another type of bases in the 189,000 pairs which do not code for amino acids. Stop codon is the triplet which indicates the ris ribosome to stop building the polypeptide. This is a triplet on the mRNA. 
Question 3. Figure 3.1 is a diagram of an area of flowing tissue from a transverse section through the stem of a squash plant. So for example, if you had a branch, let's say only this part of the branch is taken out. Although in reality, the section would be much smaller. Part 1. Cell X and Y in figure 3.1 are sieve tube elements. So these two were here. Explain why cell X and Y have different appearances in the transverse section. Again here you need to know the structure of a phloem tube of phloem tissue. Y shows sieve plates which is a part of a sieve tube and this section of the stem does not have a sieve plate in X which you can see over here. Sieve plate in X may be visible in a section taken from a different height of the stem. For example, if you took a section from here, you might find the sieve plate in X since you won't necessarily have a sieve plates in all of the tubes at the exact same position in a stem of a plant. Part 2. Sucrose is formed from the glucose synthesized by mesophyll cells in the leaves of this plant. Explain how companion cells are involved in the transfer of sucrose into phloem sieve tubes. So here you're supposed to explain the loading and unloading process for translocation of sucrose using sieve tube elements. For this explanation, I'd like to draw the structure of sieve tube elements. So the first column over here is phloem sieve tube. The second one over here is the companion cell. And let's say this is the leaf cell which will synthesize sucrose. There is a protein in the cell surface membrane of companion cell. Let's say over here, this protein will pump protons or hydrogen ions into the cell surface membrane of the companion cell. As the concentration of protons in the cell wall increase, this will reduce the pH. Then protons will diffuse down the concentration gradient into the companion cells. So first they move into the cell wall of the companion cell. And this will use ATP. After this, the protons will diffuse back into the companion cells. And this second movement would be through a co-transporter protein in the cell wall of companion cell. This co-transporter protein will not only allow the movement of protons, but also sucrose into the companion cell. After this, sucrose, which is in the companion cell, will diffuse through the plasmodes matter from the companion cell into the phloem sieve tube. Again, this is a mechanism which you will need to commit to memory. Part B, hydrogen bonding is important in the movement of water in xylem. Explain how it occurs between two water molecules. Hydrogen bonding occurs between the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom of two different water molecules. Since water is a polar molecule, oxygen in a water molecule has a partial negative charge and hydrogen in a water molecule has a partial positive charge. So hydrogen atom of a single water molecule will form a hydrogen bond with oxygen atom of another water molecule. This is how you can represent a hydrogen bond in a diagram. So the partial negative charge of oxygen is attracted to and forms hydrogen bond with the partial positive charge of hydrogen of another water molecule. This partial charge results from the fact that oxygen and hydrogen atoms have different electronegativities. So oxygen will attract the bonding pair of electrons in this bond more towards itself 
which gives it the negative charge and due to the electron deficiency hydrogen will become uh, or it will have a partial positive charge part 2 outline how hydrogen bonding is involved in water transport in the xylem of a plant cell hydrogen bonding results in cohesion and addition cohesion is due to bonding between due to hydrogen bonding between water molecule which will form unbroken column of water in the xylem vessel addition will result from polar water molecules that form hydrogen bonds with the hydrophilic cellulose in the cell wall of xylem vessel so not only are the water molecules attracted to each other they are also attracted to the cellulose found in the xylem wall Part 3 Hydrogen bonding between water molecules gives water a relatively high latent heat of vaporization. Suggest why it's important to plants that water has a high latent heat of vaporization. High latent heat of vaporization means a lot of energy is required to convert water from its liquid form to its vapor form. And uh, due to this, due to the high latent heat of vaporization, a small amount of water loss will provide large cooling effect for the plant. And as a result of this cooling effect, not only water will be conserved, it will also prevent the plant enzymes from getting denatured by the heat. Latent heat of vaporization means the energy that's required to convert water from its liquid to vapor form. And it's quite high for water molecules due to hydrogen bonding between them. These bonds are strong, which means in order to break the bonds, between what liquid water molecules and convert them into vapor you need a lot of energy which is why the latent heat of vaporization of water is high question 4 Tuberculosis, influenza, and polio are examples of infectious diseases. Explain what's meant by an infectious disease. This is a disease that's caused by pathogen and it's also transmissible. Meaning it can be passed from one person to another. Part 2. Name a species of organism that causes TB. That would be Mycobacterium tuberculosis or Mycobacterium boys. Be careful to write the genus name with the capital letter and the species name with smaller, small letter. B. Immunity can be described as artificial or natural and passive or active. Name the type of immunity that a mother gives to the baby through best breast milk. So that would be natural passive immunity. Natural because the baby gains it from the mother and it's passive because antibodies are not produced inside of the baby. Instead. They are received from another organism. C. The influenza virus can mutate frequently to produce different strains of the virus. A new vaccine is often necessary to stimulate the production of new antibodies to these new strains. Explain why different antibodies need to be produced to give immunity to these new strains. When a virus mutates, the antigen proteins that are present on its surface will also change since these proteins are coded by the genetic material. So the genetic material will change, this will change the structure of the proteins on the surface of virus. Now the vaccine provides, will it will, the new vaccine will provide virus with altered antigens to the body meaning the vaccine would have a virus of the new strains that have new antigens. And when this, is, this vaccine is received by a person and the person carries out an immune response, antibodies that are specific to the new antigens will be produced. Meaning 
that antibody antibodies that have a variable region would be complementary to the new antigens and that is how the person will become immune to the new strains Part D polio is a serious viral disease affecting young children. In 1996, polio caused paralysis in more than 75,000 children across Africa. A long term vaccination program allowed the World Health Organization to declare that Africa was largely free of polio in 2020. One explain how vaccination programs can help to control the spread of infectious diseases such as polio. So infectious diseases, again, they will be spread if infected people come into contact with each other. If you want to prevent the spread of these diseases, one way to ensure this is to vaccinate people, which means that they won't get infected. If they are not infected, they won't be able to spread it to others or transmit it to other people. And this will reduce the total number of people who are infected. Vaccination programs, like mentioned over here, will allow most of the children to have an immune response. So the immune response is carried out when an antigen, a foreign antigen in the vaccine is introduced into the body. As immune response is carried out, the children will develop long-term active immunity. This happens because the immune response will allow memory cells to be produced and stored in the body, which means if the same um, pathogen were to attack the immune person again, they would not get infected. So now vaccinated children will not transmit polio and herd, immun herd immunity is achieved, which essentially means that most of the population is immune so there are fewer chances of spreading the disease Part 2. Antibiotics such as penicillin do not help to prevent the spread of viral diseases such as polio. Explain why it's not affected against viruses. Antibiotics work by damaging the bacterial cell wall, which is why they can only work on bacteria and not on viruses. Viruses do not have cell walls. Question 5. Pneumonia is a severe lung disease that can interfere with gas exchange. A person with pneumonia can be connected to an ECMO machine. The machine performs a gas exchange function of lungs. So it will allow the exchange of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide between the machine and blood of the infected person. A cannula tube is inserted into the right atrium and this takes blood to the ECMO machine. In the ECMO machine, the blood is firstly passed is passed firstly to an artificial pump and then to an oxygenator where gas exchange occurs. The blood is then warmed and returns by another cannula to the vena cava. Okay, so in a healthy person, right atrium receives blood from the body through the vena cava. So if this cannula tube is inserted, inserted into the right atrium and it takes blood from the right atrium, this means the tube will take deoxygenated blood from the person's body. So uh, again, back to the circulatory system of a healthy person. The right atrium will receive blood from a body through vena cava. It will then pass to the red right ventricle, which will pump the blood to lungs for oxygenation. And then oxygenated blood will travel from the lungs to the left atrium and then left ventricle. Left ventricle will pump the blood to the body through iota. In here, 
Part A asks you to complete figure 5.1 to show how the ECMO machine is connected to the right atrium and to the vena cava. Use a single line to represent each cannula. So we know that one tube will connect the right atrium to the pump and then the second tube will connect the, the machine to the vena cava. Let me just label this heart, heart over here. This is the aorta. Here you've got the pulmonary artery. This is the inferior vena cava, which brings blood to the heart from the lower body. And this is the superior vena cava, which brings blood to the heart from the brain. Here you've got the right atrium. So we know that the first cannula is to be connected from the right atrium to the artificial pump. So that would be something like this. And then the second one would connect the ECMO machine to the vena cava. This can be either superior or inferior. I'd connect it to the inferior vena cava. And that's all you need to do. B, in the oxygenator, partially permeable membrane separates the blood from air that's been enriched with extra oxygen. Part 1, state the name of a structure in the gas exchange system that has the same function as the partially permeable membrane of the oxygenator. So in the lungs, you've got blood capillaries that will surround the alveoli. So gas exchange will occur in the alveoli as oxygen gas will diffuse from the alveoli into the, into the capillaries and carbon dioxide will diffuse from capillaries into the alveoli which is which will have the partially which will act as the partially permeable membrane in a in the lungs since the alveoli have a single cell in their walls so they can act as the partially permeable membrane Part 2 in the oxygenator, blood and oxygen enriched air flow in opposite directions. So just to explain how the oxygenator carries out the function of gas exchange that normally occur in the lungs. So the oxygenator would facilitate gas exchange just as lungs would. So here you need to know the features of a gas exchange surface and how the process is carried out in the lungs which means oxygen will diffuse from alveoli into capillaries and carbon dioxide will diffuse in the opposite direction. Similarly, in the oxygenator, you've got a partially permeable membrane which will act as alveoli here. So oxygen will diffuse from oxygen enriched air in the machine into the blood and carbon dioxide will diffuse from the blood of the person into the oxygenator air. These gases will diffuse down their concentration gradient just like they would normally in the lungs. The opposite direction of flow and oxygen enriched air will maintain a steep diffusion gradient just like you would have in lungs again. This means the rate of diffusion of gases will not slow down. You could also mention other features of, a, of an efficient gas exchange system gas exchange surface for example large surface area or a short diffusion pathway See, figure 5.2 is a photomicrograph showing a transverse section of the part of the human artery of the human iota. Explain how the structure of tunica media in figure 5.2 is different from the structure of tunica media in a muscular artery. 
and relate the difference to the function of the iota. When we learn about arteries, we when we learn about, about blood vessels, we learn about the differences between arteries, veins, and capillaries. And we know that the difference in their structures are due to the difference that due to the difference in the functions that they perform. Now here we know that human iota will perform a different function from the from a muscular artery. Using this information we can try and differentiate between we can suggest differences between these two arteries. We know that normally arteries have tunica media with elastic fibers which allow them to stretch and recoil to maintain blood pressure. Now the human iota is closer to the heart. This is the artery which will take blood out of the heart and into the entire body. This is the largest artery. It has the most amount of elastic fibers in its tunica media and that's because it's closer to the heart so it has to bear a lot higher pressure. As arteries move further away from the heart the blood pressure is lost slightly as distance from the heart increases. So a muscular artery in a muscle, for example uh, the femoral artery which supplies blood to the leg would have uh, fewer elastic fibers in its tunica media because it will have lower blood pressure which means it doesn't have to withstand as high of a blood pressure as an iota would. The many elastic fibers in the human iota would allow it would allow the artery to stretch and recoil and maintain blood pressure while the heart pumps. The, some biologists investigated the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood of Cayman Lateroceros, a type of reptile. The biologists found that when it respires, most of the carbon dioxide is converted into hydrogen carbonate ions in the red blood cells. And they also found that hydrogen carbonate ions combine with hemoglobin inside the red blood cells. The hydrogen carbonate ions also remain combined with hemoglobin until blood reaches the lungs. Part 1 explain why the physiology of this reptile requires carbonic anhydrase. When carbon dioxide is produced in the body of the reptile, it will move into the blood and it will get it will react with water to form carbonic anhydrase, which will dissociate to form hydrogen carbonate ions. And we know that hydrogen carbonate ions are formed and they will bind with hemoglobin. So for carbonic, hydrogen carbonate ions to form, the carbon dioxide from let's say the respiration in the lizard first has to react with water and this reaction is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Part 2 explain why the physiology of the reptile does not require the chloride shift. So we are, it's mentioned in the question here that hydrogen carbonate ions remain combined with hemoglobin until the blood reaches the lungs. Chloride shift occurs when hydrogen carbonate ions move out of the red blood cell and as a mechanism to maintain pH, chloride ions would move into the red blood cells. As the question mentions, hydrogen carbonate ions do not move out of red blood cells. Instead, they remain combined with hemoglobin. So there is no need for chloride ions to move into the cells, which is why chloride shift is also not required. Question 6a. Collagen is the most common structural protein in vertebrates. It provides the skin with flexibility and strength. Explain how the structure of the collagen fiber provides the skin with strength. So collagen is an insoluble fibrous protein. Each collagen molecule has three polypeptide chains in a helix shape that are wound together by hydrogen or covalent bonds. 
that's a collagen molecule fiber is the collagen fiber is composed of more than one collagen molecules so covalent bonds will form between the r groups of two collagen molecules that are parallel to each other these covalent bonds will provide the strength and make the collagen bond strong enough for structures like the skin The enzyme collagenase breaks down collagen. Collagenase has several important medical uses such as in the treatment of burnt skin. Scientists investigated the effect of pH on the activity of collagenase at 37 degrees Celsius, so the temperature was maintained. The results of their investigation are shown in figure 6.1. As you can see, as the pH increases from 5 up until 7.4, the enzyme activity increases and beyond 7 pH 7 as the pH increases the activity decreases which means the enzyme starts to denature. Explain why the activity of collagenase is lower at pH 8 than at the optimum pH. So optimum pH would be the pH where the activity is maximum and you can clearly see that the activity at pH is lower. pH 8 is too alkaline for this enzyme. From pH 5 to 7.4, the enzyme activity increases and afterward it decreases as the enzyme denatures. So at pH 8, the ionic bonds between R groups of the protein are altered because of which enzyme will lose its tertiary structure, which is uh, held by other bonds, including ionic bonds. So if ionic bonds are damaged, the tertiary structure would also be damaged. As a result of this, the shape of active site changes and enzyme activity decreases. Since enzymes use their active site to catalyze a reaction. And this is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.